as soon as i learn what my place is in just our galaxy forget rest of the universe uh, that itself blows you apart Welcome. It's ChargerCast, the COVID-19 edition. Look where we are. It's not the regular studio. We're all sequestered at home, but it's kind of given us an opportunity to expand our horizons a little bit. And joining us today live from Nashville, Tennessee in the United States is Dr. Karan Johnny, who is an astrophysicist. Uh, Dr. Johnny, thanks for coming on ChargerCast. Well, Nick, thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. So you have a very interesting story and a very interesting journey. You started in Vidodra, and now you've ended up in Nashville at Vanderbilt University, but you've also been at Penn State. You've also been at Georgia Tech. Um, so I'm curious to learn a little bit more about sort of your story, but uh, I introduced you as an astrophysicist. Can you describe a little bit more about sort of who you are and, and the work you're doing? Yeah, hi. So I, um, I'm an astrophysicist, meaning I try to understand how the astrophysical phenomena or the, how the universe is really encompassed of. I try to understand how the universe started, why the universe is the way it is, you know, what conditions led it to have us here on planet Earth, you know, what does it mean to actually look at stars? So that is what my day-to-day -day job is. Um, and that is what I've been working on for last about uh, 13 years, whether it's part of being a student, whether it's a researcher, and over the years now here at uh, as a research professor. So this is what I do. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I mean, you're, you're asking all the sort of the big, big questions in life. Um, so I, you're an astrophysicist, obviously. I'm kind of a science idiot, to be totally frank with you. Um, I, in college, I took astronomy 101, and I thought I was going to walk into a classroom where it was going to be like, find Orion's belt, and yeah. like, this is Sagittarius, and Mars is red. And it turned out it was a whole lot of math and planets shift and you can measure how far away they are. And it was, I, it was a total disaster for me. Um, so I, I inspired you to sort of follow a, a science path in, in your life. I think it always starts with this um, underlying curiosity that builds over the years. It's hard to pick, pinpoint when it, the curiosity starts growing in you, but you reach a certain threshold after which you want to get an answer as close and as quote unquote rational as you can get. So I was very intrigued, you know, by um, this existential questions, you know, we are here on this sort of limited time on this planet earth, you know, what is sort of the large purpose that we as individual human beings have, what we as a human race have. And that led to sort of, you know, trying to um, find, you know, as soon as I learned what my place is, in just our galaxy, forget rest of the universe, uh, that itself blows you apart. You know? uh, and what I have been trying to do since is understand in a very rigorous scientific framework, this larger questions, um, you know, from the very point of, you know, how did the Big Bang start? Uh, and um, what happens, you know, why are the laws of nature the way they are? So that is what I think has been my permanent driving goal and it still remains so. I, I, look, it's a fair point, right? But these are pretty heavy questions about when, when on your journey do you actually sort of begin and when do you, when does that spark come? Uh, but these are pretty serious sort of questions, right? And pretty heavy questions, especially I'm picturing you as like a 10 year old kid in, in, in Gujarat thinking like, what is my place in the world? Like it's pretty heavy stuff. Like at, at what point did you sort of make up your mind though? Were you, were you like your teenager or were you like, this is, man, this is it, this is, this is me. I think it was the very um, confusion of not knowing what to do, uh, which I think a lot of teenagers in India in general can associate with you go through this phase. And uh, we have this sort of a gunpoint decision, you know, right after 10th, do you take, do you learn arts? Do you go into commerce? Do you learn science? Within science, do you become a doctor? Do you become an engineer? So it's a lot of decisions you have to take early on by the time you're almost like 15, 16. And not knowing to me at least that I don't fit into any of them. Like I didn't have any natural um, desire to be an engineer or a doctor, not that I sort of uh, down look any of this profession. It's just, I did not see myself there. And that's why it required a lot of introspection at that early age. You know, so then of course you don't want to do this, 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 essentially what you want to do. And uh, 
I remember reading about the universe as pretty much as the first time when we were in 10th grade. And uh, the, we had this um, whole notion of, you know, what is the infinity, you know, like a very mathematical definition of what is infinity just before you start calculus. My teacher said something which struck me still late is that you have to understand infinity if you really have to understand what the universe is. All right, so you're in, you're in, you're committed, you are like, this is it, infinity of the universe, big, big, big questions, where do we come from? Um, the, but somehow you ended up at Penn State University, a giant research university in the, the northeast part of the United States. Um, how did you go from Vidodra, I assume you're still in Vidodra at this point, to um, making a decision to apply for a U.S. university and then uh, attend? Yeah, it was a... Um... It was a very crazy story because I was already enrolled in a university back in my hometown. I knew I wanted to study physics, which I was uh, enrolled for. Um, and then I realized uh, as this teenager who has very limited narrow vision of education that no, I don't want to study everything else in physics. I only want to study astronomy. I want to understand these big questions. Don't force me to understand what thermodynamics or what mechanics of a system is. Uh, I was naive enough to not realize that uh, you know, physics and mathematics training is much more crucial. So in that process, uh, I ended up deciding, well, I want to specialize. I want to do an undergraduate degree in astronomy. And that already limited it to very few places. Uh, and within even United States, there are only countable colleges that would offer a, a full undergraduate education in astrophysics. Uh, Penn State being one of the uh, one of the top three uh, programs for undergraduate astrophysics. Uh, so I applied there. Um, and it was the time when India had uh, cyber cafes. You know, remember that era? So you have to go to a cyber cafe, like pay this prepaid fee and get some time on internet, uh, find anyone on a website and send an email through your Yahoo account that you don't no longer use, of course. So I did that whole thing. I sent like... Um, a desperate teenager, you know, emails to professor in the United States saying that, look, I have this, I want to really understand astronomy and uh, is there a way I can apply? You know, how do I apply? Fortunately, a professor who was the uh, undergraduate program head at Penn State Astronomy, she responded and uh, she guided me through every spot that, okay, now you see the first thing is you have to give an SAT exam. This is how you begin. So yeah, that's how it actually started. <laughs> Wow. So you're literally sitting in an internet cafe, sort of reaching out into the ether for, I want to study astrophysics uh, help. And someone did at Penn yeah. State, uh, no less. Wow, that is a weird story. Well, uh, I, now that I'm in this position, like I get at least the 50 emails every week from students, something on the similar note. Uh, you're now, kidding. Yeah. I mean, I get, uh, whether it's on Instagram messages, whether it's on emails, um, like dozens every week. And they asked me somewhat in the similar sense that, look, we are finishing our 12th. What should we do next? You know, we want to study astrophysics, what we do. And I now make it a point to respond to as many as I can, because I knew that someone did respond to me as crazy as it was. And that made a hell lot of difference. I would have still applied perhaps maybe through just reading on a website, but someone vouching that, yes, you could make a career. Yes, you leave everything and come to United States all alone with your um, free luggage and come to Happy Valley and would be fine. So I, I do try to do that. So what do you, so what do you tell students now then? I mean, if someone, re what, what do you tell the aspiring, young, <laughs> the aspiring young astrophysicist? Well, now my answer is much more caliber, calibrated because I also know a lot more about Indian institutions. Uh, that the astronomy now has become uh, more mainstream than it was perhaps uh, 13 years ago when I left. Uh, and uh, so I am able to at least tell them, look, you know, even if you do an undergraduate degree in physics, this is essentially a very important step. Because when I ended up going to Penn State, I started an astronomy major. After my freshman, I, double, I decided I have to double major in physics because I was very interested in Einstein's general theory of relativity, which was all physics. And by the time I was junior, I decided that, well, I need to know more math. So I also started my math degree, but I ended up having a minor in math. So two degrees plus minor um, and research every summer and every semester, pretty much. 
so so is this what you're t- i mean is this what you're telling young people then that like, you better look this is great that you want to do this but be prepared for some hard work and you know this is it's not a uh it's not a walk in the, I, I wouldn't imagine anyone would think astrophysics is a walk in the park but um, like this this is your message like this is serious or what I say is that you have to build a lot more skills you know the word astrophysics the, the early fascination is oh I'm just gonna sit with a telescope and observe the universe that is absolutely not true like I cannot point anything more than solar system objects perhaps with a telescope and I realized very early on that as soon as I had to be at a telescope at 3 a.m. in Pennsylvania mornings I was like, no, I can't do this for the rest of my life. So I realized that I want to be a theoretical physicist more so. Um, And uh, then I, you know, the amount of computing I use is as much as any computer science student does. So no matter where you start, those skills eventually can be translated into not just astrophysics, it could be any field, but from my experience, um, astrophysics. Right. So if I, so you're saying I want to be an astrophysicist, but if I have an undergrad degree in computer science, maybe that's more marketable down the road. If I change my mind, um, I'm going to have to use those skills anyway. Same thing with math, right? I mean, math at the end of the day, it sort of feels like everyone should just major in math, right? Because if, mm-hmm. it, as I recall, again, being very terrible in this area, physics was a ton of math. Astronomy was a ton of math. Computer science is a ton of, like, it's all math, right? Yes. You, uh, and it's this, uh, I mean, math is like this, it's, it's a universe by itself, right? Um, there's so many interesting problems that uh, what happens is on your way somewhere as a researcher, especially in a field of research, you hit the maturity where you learn only things which help you directly with your research. Mm. Because otherwise you get lost in learning too much um, so I'll do um, a lot of uh, high performance computing, machine learning, but I only pick things which help me solve my problem. Otherwise, there's a, a whole industry I have to learn. Sure, you end up going down the rabbit hole and then, yes. um, yeah, you can never get focused. So t- take me back to, uh, you arrive in Happy Valley, in Pennsylvania, uh, <laughs> with, with, your, with your three bags. Um, what's, what's your first week like? What's your first day? What's your first month? Uh, it, I mean, first is like you stay, like staying in a dorm itself is a experience. Um, not knowing uh, football culture is also an experience. It's American football. And in Penn State, by the way, very big deal, American football. Yes. Uh, so I didn't know how big a deal was Joe Paterno until I actually arrived on campus. Um, but it was a great, you know, I, I, you instantly connect with other international students. Um, you know, coming from you know, South Korea, um, Japan, you know, other students who were part of like physics or astrophysics programs, we would meet and then I would get to learn, well, you know, I'm not the only odd one out who had this kind of questions to answer. You know, there are people across the globe who have this and it's very comforting to sit in your first class and see around that there are dozens of students who want to pursue the same thing which you wanted to. Oh. Yeah, right on. So, but it's, that's really touching, actually. It's like, oh, I felt alone, and now I felt alone in the universe, uh, and now here I am, and there's all these people who sort of want the same thing I do. You kind of found your uh, your tri- tribe. <laughs> Especially coming from, uh, it's very hard to um, per, sort of explain to a larger folks, you know, that pursuing pure science, you're essentially want to make a career and you have no role models or no one like you. I had never seen a scientist in flesh and blood in my life until I went to Penn State. I met a professor and then of course this word that yes, professors are scientists because they are also researchers with PhDs who've been through this. So to, you know, really seeing that, yes, you know, people can make careers in this. Uh, even that was a question mark to me before. Huh. I- on the culture shock side of things, was there anything that sort of like you remember as being a big touch point from when, when you arrived, like, you know, food or clothing or, you know, any, anything in particular? Well, there's always this adjustment. And I think it would have been like now that I, you know, talk with my other friends who move in different states of India and uh-huh. the level of culture shock, you know, of, or not culture shock, but the adjustment is similar with, with food mainly. <laughs> Uh, because you uh, you're used to this one certain palette, but the 
Um, good thing was um, with other Indian students that I was, you know, who were there with me as an undergraduate student, we meet and we all are experiencing sort of, you know, the same things and sharing, um, like, oh, did you check Berkey Creamery ice cream? That has been so great. So you like, you no. check that. So it, it's an exploration you do with other people. So I think it was, um, I just have fond memories. Yeah. Um, now, Penn State's a giant universe. I don't know the numbers, but my guess is probably twenty or 30,000 people. Uh, any sense of getting lost in the crowd or, or, you know, it's sort of an impersonal type of institution? Uh, for the, uh, if you take one of some of the larger classes, like I remember taking a sociology class, which was the classroom itself was as big as, I mean, quote unquote, a football field, almost to say 700 students taking it. Um, but the, that was one of the best classes that I've ever taken. You know, the way I learned about certain sociological issues prevalent worldwide, not just in the United States, changed me as a human being, even if I was in a 700 lecture class. That said, every other classes that I took uh, in advanced mathematics and advanced astronomy, but we are only like four or five students at the end. Oh, right on. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, when, not, there's not 700 people in the advanced astrophysics class. Yeah, so when we had our graduation walk, we were only five people. Ah, oh, that's great. Uh, so did, did you know you were going to get a PhD like from day one? I mean, was there ever a point where I ah, got undergrad in astrophysics, this is, this is good? Oh, I think the path, there was a level of uncertainty. I knew I absolutely want to do it. And uh, the great thing that happened was when I was a freshman um, in Penn State, now they at least encourage everyone to start working on research projects. Um, mm -hmm. You are going to be in a field which is so specialized that you ought to get some training. Um, so I, again, the same thing, sending out emails to professors that, oh, hey, I'm this international student freshman. Um, I'm interested in doing research. Uh, is there any opportunity, etc.? So one of the professors um, responded, and many responded actually, almost everyone at Penn State was kind enough. And one of them responded and said that, hey, have you heard about gravitational waves? I was like, no. Like, well, you know, this is one of the things, it's a long-standing quest by Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity, which has not been proved for over hundred years now, close to hundred years then. And would you want to work on something similar to this? So I was like, wow, yeah, that sounds like the most exciting thing I've heard. Little I knew, uh, my advisor there, Professor Lee Sam Finn, was a PhD student of Professor Kip Thorne. And Kip ended up winning the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics for the discovery of gravitational waves. Um, the very team that I was then part of for the first discovery. Oh, so great. Okay. First of all, I want to know, okay, so you sent out emails and a researcher got back to you and, and you know, the rest was history and we'll get into that. But coming back to something you said earlier, are you getting emails now from people saying, hey, I'm looking to do the research as well? And what, are, and what are you telling them when they write you now? So I, I think fortunately that since um, it's a very Georgia Tech and even now here at Vanderbilt, there is a much more established uh, channel of how to make sure the students are engaged with research projects. Uh, so in, uh, Penn, in Georgia Tech, we had a course on research that students can just register for. And then we would divide them in different research areas and just each of us would sort of sit with the students for like whole two semesters a minimum and train them on certain skills. Some of them ended up writing papers with me. Um, almost all of them ended up going to PhD programs in physics. So I, yeah, so I think now I'm AI, I mean, once I was there, I knew this was much more of a normal thing as an undergraduate to have a research program. Sure. Um, okay, so you end up at Georgia Tech. Uh, you came from Penn State. You came from New England, uh, in the northeast part of the United States, to uh, Georgia Tech, which it's, uh, is it in Atlanta or is it close to Atlanta? It's midtown Atlanta. Yeah, so you go to, to this very sort of like, you know, you're in the deep south. Um, Atlanta's kind of an interesting place. Uh, what, was, what was that experience? Oh, I absolutely loved uh, being in Atlanta. I was actually um, had PhD admits from other places, but I was convinced I don't want to be at a place which snows. So I knew I had to go as south as possible. Wow. Because uh, I, had, I had enough share of my winters. And especially if you imagine that in winter break, you come back to Gujarat, um, where, you know, 
15 degrees Celsius, 18, that's like the coldest. And then you take flight back, land in State College, and it's like minus 30 degrees Celsius almost. Yeah, I those had, New England winters. I had my fair share of uh, being in winters. No, I, I still love it. I went to actually give uh, to Penn State uh, last fall to give a colloquium, and I absolutely love the campus and being there. But it was great to be at Georgia Tech because it was a city campus. And it had, uh, the university was also um, philosophically very different uh, in the sense that everyone who came had a very focused uh, career goals, you know, something where you know, they will want to work with startups, they want to open startups, uh, you know, like this very entrepreneurial university experience. So I was still in my um, mindset of being in this learning, uh, I don't know, for lack of a better word, you know, like in like some sort of a guru cool in up north where you're just by yourself and trying to understand this deep laws of nature. And now you come to a university where computing is such an important aspect of everything, computer science. You see people wearing Google glasses and walking on campus, all these ideas around. And so I, that made me a different scientist at the end. Yeah, I mean, you're with all these, compu with all these computer guys and people who, you know, are, are launching the next big ventures. So, I mean, as you're getting sort of all this exposure to computer science, is there any part of you that was like, gosh, maybe this is a little more interesting or maybe I want to, you know, create the next Uber or something? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, no, I, I, I think I was very set with my, um, with my limitations. I understood that I would perhaps not survive for long in an industry. But uh, I knew I, I was really wanting to learn uh, the, uh, the buzzwords of data science, etc. It just ended up being very key to my PhD thesis. So my thesis wa was a way to take Einstein's equation, to find black holes on supercomputers. That was essentially the core of my thesis. And that required me to go from the astrophysics and math to really the hardcore computer architecture. All right, so let's talk science then, since, you're, since we're, we seem to be heading in that direction anyways. Um, let's start with, I'm hoping we can kind of talk about your work a little bit um, and sort of how to understand it and how to wrap our heads around it as a sort of a lay person, right? Yeah. Um, so gravitational waves, let's start with those. I yeah. feel like I just watched a movie where there was a British scientist who tried to prove gravitational waves by taking pictures of the sun in Africa somewhere. And maybe, maybe that wasn't what it was, but um, <laughs> I don't even know where to begin with this. All right, uh, talk to me about gravity and gravitational waves, but yeah. I have an eight-year-old daughter, okay? Explain it to me like I'm my eight-year-old daughter. Yes, okay. So for the longest time, we had a notion of gravity that was inspired from Isaac Newton, where we kept thinking that gravity is this force. So, you know, sun is pulling earth and that's why we are sort of going in an orbit and the earth is pulling us. That's why we are stuck on earth. And that is how we kept thinking of gravity in general. And then Einstein in its, um, many of its revolutionary uh, ideas had this very simple childlike question that if you remove a sun tomorrow, from the universe, that's an alien comes and picks our sun away. Would the earth still be going around? And the answer is, well, no, of course, there is no center uh, of gravity. So then the second question is, when would we stop? Uh, when would earth realize that there is no sun? Oh, like is there mo like the momentum would keep going like on a carnival ride or yeah, something? So if it was going around in circles, and suddenly you took the sun, does it happen that very instance you realize? Do you realize and Pluto, which is very far away, also realize at the same time? And so the key point was that gravity has to travel to you, just like how light has to travel to you. And the one way to imagine this travel is, is in a simple way thinking there are some waves of gravitational that are sort of, you know, some form of, you know, um, connection between you two. So okay. for example, and if you take the sun away, we would still be in orbit for eight minutes because that much light takes to and nothing can travel faster than speed of light. So that was one of these initial ideas Einstein had. 
but we could not fully prove gravitational waves because they are just so impossibly weak around us. For example, every 15 minutes, uh, there is a gravitational wave that comes uh, from black holes that touches every cell of your body and vanishes from Earth. And it not only touches yours, it touches everything around us. But we don't have a notion of it. We actually cannot feel anything and the Earth also doesn't have any response to it because gravity itself is so weak. When I have my... Um, I can hold this mouse with my two fingers and the entire earth is trying to pull it down. But my two fingers have more strength than the gravity of whole earth combined. That's how weak gravity is. Okay, so then measuring it becomes close to impossible or has been, it had been impossible up until um, LIGO, which is the, uh, I'm gonna forget what, in interferometer or something? It's the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. Uh, LIGO, LIGO. Uh, it was an experiment that uh, started um, constructing in 90s. And it became operational in 2000s. So when I was an undergraduate, I was a part of a group, research group, where um, most of the people were working on LIGO. And uh, by until 2015, there was no confirmed detection in the data that there is gravitational waves. So this thing work though um the the the, med, the how do you how do you measure these waves yeah so it's very uh, intriguing uh technique the problem is because gravity affects everything around you the same way um uh, it's very hard to know if a wave has passed through you so what actually gravitational waves does is as soon as it comes to you it stretches every atom in our body actually even below atoms it stretches the very space around us and it's a it's um it is to do because space time, because we live in a four dimensional universe. We actually don't live in a 3D universe that we two are so used to and our brain keeps tricking that everything is three dimensional. Um, so it's a manifestation of that. But in simple sense, imagine a gravitational wave comes to your room, everything in your room would stretch and shrink, stretch and shrink. It would keep doing it until the waves are around and then it will just leave. So what we try to do is we keep two mirrors far apart and try to measure how much it takes for light to come. And if a gravitational wave passes, the distance between the two mirror changes, and we can find that exact distance. How far, how far apart are these mirrors? Uh, so the, the way the setup is called an interferometer, which is the eye in LIGO, uh, the mirrors are separated by four kilometers. Jesus. And the, uh, so you have one such in uh, rural Louisiana. You have one such in Washington, in the West Coast. And uh, the wave practically comes on Earth at both locations at the same time. So we know exactly the mirror's mode. All right. So mirror A is here. Mirror B is four kilometers away here. There's a laser basically bouncing between them. And if the distance between those mirrors shift, that's a gravitational wave. How do you not account for like, just the movement of the earth or like a, a truck drives by? And it does and everything is a source of noise. So we have over the years made this experiment, the most sensitive experiment on planet earth but to measure this. We are actually looking at a change which is millionth the size of a proton. Forget even anything else. And we know that we are, what we have seen is truly astrophysical because it happens at both different sites one in Louisiana, right. one in Washington, in the almost exact fashion. So if you see how those mirrors move, what frequency they move has to be precisely correct, matching. Okay. Now, is that why there are plans to build another one uh, here in Maharashtra, right? Yes. There, there's there's going to be, this is yes. the same to help triangulate and... That is very correct. So um, after we had the successful discovery back in when we announced in 2016, um, um, the Prime Minister of India um, was when he was visiting Washington DC, and there was this formal um, MOU between the National Science Foundation and the Department of Atomic Energy in India to build this, this kind of a third detector here. Because we, we already have a third detector now in uh, Europe, which is called Virgo. 
you have a fourth detector that is started in Japan called Kagura. But then you need something which is close to the southern hemisphere because all of them are pretty much up in the northern rim. Okay. You wanted something close. Uh, it's the, the thing is same as you know how you have cell phone towers. So you have the cell phone towers triangulate, you get better signal on your phone. That is same as saying if you have more such um, hearing devices, these interferometers, you can actually pinpoint exactly where the signal came in sky from. And we need okay. to know, not just that we have detected gravitational wave, we need to know precisely where it came from in sky. And so somehow if I know where that gravitational wave came from, that tells me that there is a black hole somewhere? Like what's, what, what, what is the, okay, I found the wave, what does it mean? Yes, so we showed that actually in 2017, so not just black holes create gravitational waves, there are something called neutron stars, which are, you know, just like, a, they're like cousins of black holes, but uh, slightly less um, notorious, to put it in a wrong analogy. <laughs> um, so when the two neutron stars collide, they actually emit light and gravitational waves together. And so what we saw that one of NASA's Fermi telescope was looking and it saw a light came by and then LIGO saw the signal and we were able to sort of match where in sky it came from and it sort of overlaps. And that is key, as we understand now, to understand how the universe makes gold. So the fact that you have gold around you right now, around me, gold does not come from sun. Actually, none of the heavy earth elements, like uranium, cannot produce by sun. But the fact we see that in solar system, that means it has come from some outer cosmic phenomena bombarded on earth while earth was being born. And what? we want one way it is that the neutron stars were colliding in our galaxy and that unleashed the percentage of gold and uranium that we see right now. Uh, okay, so <laughs> my, my, my gold ring uh, was at one point part of a neutron star collision that got sent through the universe from that explosion and, and basically Earth got in the way and, and it got buried here. Yes, it could have been, you know, even the earlier uh, sort of gas that eventually became solar system. So it could have been at either of those stages, but that is true. It has not originated from sun. It has not even originated from a star dying. It has come from specifically to neutron stars. Wow, that is so weird. Um, huh. I'm trying to get my head around that. And that's, and that's all, a, that's all the heavier, it's like the silver and uranium well, and... So all of them have different phenomena that it comes through because our sun cannot really make anything more than iron. Um, but all of them have different origins, but the, the trickiest two are this, um, things like plutonium, uh, gold, uranium. Um, so there are a few greater questions now, you know, coming back to our original thing. Yeah. That we have gold on uranium other than them being fancy things. They are crucial for an advanced civilization. All our Semiconductors chips have gold. Our geopolitics is not only driven through uranium in some sense, but also the fact that if we want to reach as a civilization, a stage where we have this almost infinite resources to play around with, then we need uranium kind of elements. And that is true for any advanced civilization in this universe. So the fact that they have happened is your key tracers that yes, intelligent life could have survived. And I imagine you could narrow down if we find gold on a, if there's no heavy earth elements or heavy earth, heavy elements on a given planet, like if there's nothing on Mars, right? If, if we, we, there's no gold, there's no whatever, like that's probably an indication there was never an advanced civilization there. I think yes, we, don't, my, we don't know. I mean, because these this things are, you know, so deep, um, because they are heavy and they're so much hidden to find, right? Just like on uh, Earth, you have to do mining to essentially find these things. Um, so wherever they are, they are in very tiny um, relative abundance compared to everything else. But the fact that if you have become intelligent enough as what humans are, you would need them to do the kind of things that we are doing right now, let's say talking over internet. Okay, You're, you are a well-respected, renowned astrophysicist. Do you think there is, there is advanced life elsewhere in the universe? Yeah, the question, 
if there are none then it makes us a very difficult to understand why we are here i think it's more simpler to know that there are enough uh, but they just happen to have been at different space time cones uh, for what i mean by is suppose we if you look at um like how we make the orbit of the sun the sun makes the orbit of the center of our galaxy uh, you know there are about um, 100 billion stars in our galaxy and the sun is just one of them making an orbit and since life has started we have only made like few countable orbits and the largest that a species has stayed on this planet has been dinosaurs and the dinosaurs have been only like a, less than even a quarter of an orbit since homo sapiens started walking the earth the sun has barely moved yet so imagine now if you're looking around but the other things millions of or millions but hundreds of thousands of light years away uh, has things like dinosaurs it's unlikely that we are going to get radio signals from them and if and if something's 100,000 light years away and nothing can move faster than the speed of light any signal we would get would be 100,000 years old yes even at the speed of light yes so you'd be so, looking back god it's man okay so our best hope right now is to look at things in this few 100 light year sort of cone like a sphere around you um the which are the closest stars and thinking you know in one of the closest stars so alpha centauri for example has a planet um which is very earth like and one of my collaborators on a recent project uh, professor abraham loeb is a um, is a director of this initiative which essentially plans to send an iphone size camera to the other star to that very other planet take pictures and send it back on earth it will take about 20 years to reach there at the speed at which we can and another 8 years for the light to reach us back But in a human lifetime, you can have a picture of the nearby Earth-like planet. Wow! God, what happens if it takes a picture and there's like you know there's an elephant wandering around or something? Yeah, then then, then it's perfect. Then we know where to target after Mars. I, I, yeah, I suppose, huh? Mm-hmm. Uh, what's what's your take on on, on you know we're going to go to Mars and uh, you know s- sort of space exploration in a in a mm-hmm. physical sense? Um, Do you do you see a lot of value in sending a person to Mars? Oh yes, I think I think that is the most natural thing to do as a civilization. Um not just because anything is wrong with Earth, you know, the idea is for our species to actually build this resistance of living in conditions that are not just Earth like. And that would take, you know, a few generations to reach. And if we do so, the benefits are just so much tremendous. So for example I have just recently published a paper uh, on going to the moon and once you are at the moon you build actually a ligo there so if you uh, and the moon offers some natural conditions for example it's default vacuum so you don't have to build pipes of few kilometers like you have to do on earth you have a moon is seismically much quieter because there is a no human activity but there is also no wind moon quakes are much tinier than earthquakes so you could build a very nice gravitational wave observatory on the moon i was actually thinking about that when we were talking about seismic interference on earth like boy space is a vacuum that seems like it'd be a perfect spot to to build one of these um there's also one in space so currently one of the main things i work on is this joint european space agency nasa mission which is essentially like a ligo that you want to send in space um but now instead of 4 km you have about 2 and a half million km oh it's bigger than the sun um it's bigger than the moon and earth distance actually it's it's the biggest scientific experiment we're ever going to make it's probably going to launch in 2034 um so that's what i've been you know mostly working wow. on wow <laughs> that's pretty cool um i i i'm hesitant to ask this a little bit but i but i'm going to try to dance around it and we can let's see how it goes you're doing all the stuff that that really sort of asks the fundamental questions about the universe and and the fundamental questions about where we come from right yeah. and, and the and the origin of the universe without getting into a religious debate of any kind 
how, how do you how do you approach that question of, of where we come from and, and the physics that you understand as far as the origins of the universe versus sort of uh, we'll call it spirituality? It, it is a deeply spiritual exercise for me. Um, it is completely in uh, coherence with what I had thought, um, not just as a teenager back in India, but also the environment that I grew up around. Um, and uh, this, I think every such finding or you know, every step ahead is essentially trying to understand the grand structure in a more, most logical, rigorous way, which is outside my own belief system, which makes science so unique. So the fact that we see black holes from halfway across the universe is not a opinion of a few hundred scientists like myself, but that is a truth that independent of human race, any other species was intelligent enough would also confirm. And that means we are able to answer this grand question without our own bias interfering in its interpretations. So for me, this yeah. is a peaceful uh, spiritual exercise. And I mean, that's always sort of the argument, right? That, that, that science is about verifiable facts and being able to prove theories. Um, and, which brings us sort of back to, to square one, which is being able to, you, you working on, a on, on verifying uh, Einstein's theory of relativity through gravitational waves. Um, so that, that is now something that can be, can be established and anyone else could, could also do that. Um, yeah, I'd, maybe we'll save it for another chat, but I'd be curious to, to, to talk more about sort of the, the deeper spiritual piece of this and, and the Big Bang and what it all means, but um, maybe for another time. There's one more thing I want to ask you about. I saw in your bio that you had done a fellowship in international relations. So now we're in my, in my world, so I feel a little bit better about this. But what, what is this fellowship, and, and it's about the intersection of science and, and foreign relations, or what was that? So this was a, um, I would, again, you know, being at, uh, one of the great things about being at the U.S. universities is um, you get a chance to broaden in ways that you had not pre-planned. The same way that I had not known before joining Penn State that I was gonna major and minor in other things. When I came to Georgia Tech, I at least knew that I would get A, involved in computing, but the second one was in uh, the School of International Affairs. So Tech had a um, fellowship where they pick about six to eight PhD students every year. And uh, this is funded by the MacArthur Foundation. And they make us go through the process of understanding how science gets funded and understanding the sort of um, science diplomacy that plays around, and especially projects like the one that I do, you know, that involves 18 countries, you know, multiple funding agencies, you know, how this whole process plays out. So not only we had to go through the training, we also were at Washington DC, going through different offices, interacting for over a week, in different paths, uh, from um, from the National Academies to even FBI to going inside Pentagon, all this great exposure. And then we have to do our own independent research in this field, which has to be published. So we published a book at the end. I did one on um, a space diplomacy. So things such as, you know, one of the great space diplomacy example is what United States and India has. Um, time and again, you know, whether it is through LIGO India is the shining example of the two countries, of two democratic countries looking at science in a very um, sort of, you know, fundamental way that yes, this leads to a better nation in general. So I, I am great to, you know, be part of this whole effort. The other thing is, uh, the other fellowship I did was on big data, on the other paper I wrote, which is to understand the risk of big data from a sort of a national security, global security perspective. You know, why we need the rules, you know, why we need the stricter policies, uh, when you have this large set of data coming from Twitter, social media, etc. So this is completely different training for me from going through this astrophysics to um, real life. But what I gained the most was the, the thing that every scientist I think needs to learn is how to get science funded. Yeah, I, I like I like your space, this thing on space diplomacy though because it, it, you know it, it's funny you look at the International Space Station right and 
classic example. Um, you know, Russia, U.S. Um, you look at all the cooperation between the U.S. and India. You know, between um, uh, our, our space agencies, um, LIGO, obviously, like you mentioned, um, it really is sort of as a as a diplomat and as someone who's you know involved in, in, in this part of it. Uh, space diplomacy is a real shining, you know, bright spot, even uh, with countries who we may not have the, the best sort of geopolitical relationship with. No. Um, there's something about space that seems to transcend national boundaries, you know, in the sort of interest of, of humanity, and that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I, I think that as a scientist, so I also have this sort of a slightly selfish reason that, you know, the next experiments that I think of, so example, if we have to go to moon to build an IGO, um, this kind of effort, this kind of burden a single country cannot take for too long. You know, although, you know, we've had the great success that um, US had Fermilab, you know, one of the first such large scale accelerators, but the next one, Large Hadron Collider, needed more countries to get together and build. And so the, the higher the questions that we want to ask, the more it requires us that we as humanity have to work together if we want to understand them. You know, nice way to end it. Let's leave it there. Uh, Dr. Karan Jani, uh, astrophysicist, uh, currently at Vanderbilt University, um, works on the LIGO project, uh, went to school at Penn State, Georgia Tech, uh, now at Vanderbilt, like I mentioned. Really appreciate you coming on, uh, chatting with us. I really enjoyed our conversation, and I, I hope we can talk again soon. Well, thank you. I absolutely enjoyed it, too. Thank you so much. Okay. That's ChargerCast for this week. I'm Nick Novak.